All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by welcoming Cole Pauls to Treaty One Territory, so welcome. Um, Treaty One Territory is the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Oji Cree, and Dene nations, as well as the birthplace of the Métis. Um, Treaty One, which was signed in 1871, took this territory from seven local Anishinaabe First Nations in order to make the land available for settler use and ownership. As an English language arts teacher, it's important for me to remember that the, ling the language and academic discipline of English are complicit in Canada's um, continuing and ongoing injustices and inequities and violences that threaten the health, well-being, and safety of our Indigenous peoples. As we acknowledge English's complicity, um, it's also important to recognize that the diverse ways that artists and thinkers from various Indigenous communities are revitalizing English to produce vibrant, expressive literatures and cultures. Today's event is part of the term's programming for the One Book UW Initiative um, and the Gallery 1CO3 exhibit when Raven became Spider. Cole's lecture is sponsored by the Department of English, the Collegiate, the Gallery 1CO3, and the Waywene Indigenous Speakers Series. His presentation today is being recorded and will be posted on the One Book UW website. After his talk, Cole will be tabling with his book and other items in the Gallery 1CO3 over the lunch hour. Um, so Cole Pauls is a Telton comic artist, illustrator, and printmaker hailing from Haines Junction, which is Yukon Territory, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in illustration from Emily Carr University. Residing in Vancouver, Pauls focuses on his two comic series, the first being Pizza Punks, a self-contained comic strip about punks eating pizza, and the other being Dakota Warriors. In 2017, Pauls won Broken Pencil Magazine's Best Comic and Best Zine of the Year Award for Dakota Warriors 2. This fall, Paul Cole has been touring Canada to celebrate the release of the Dakota Warriors graphic novel, uh, newly collected and published by Conundrum Press. Cole is in Winnipeg to lead a week-long graphic novel workshop for youth at Art City. In addition to the display of his work up now in the Gallery 1CO3 foyer, selected pieces created during this workshop will be displayed there as well. So thank you, Cole. Uh, thank you. That was really eloquent. Um, hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, like, uh, like she said, I'm on a, a book tour, and this is uh, my last leg of the book tour. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been like all over. I, w I started in the Yukon. I did a Yukon book release. Uh, the world premiere of my graphic novel was in my hometown, Haines Junction. And uh, we had a big potluck, and we served the whole community. We fed over 80 people. Um, the Dakota Dancers, the traditional song and dance group from my hometown, performed. And I performed with them for the first time in 10 years. Um, it was really special. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been touring all over. I did a Haines Junction, Whitehorse, Dawson, uh, Vancouver, Victoria, Gibsons, Portland, Seattle, uh, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and now Winnipeg, my last uh, date. Um, so yeah, this is uh, my uh, graphic novel, Dakota Warriors. Uh, it's a language revitalization comic, so it's bilingual. It's got Southern Toshone and English in it. And uh, this is the cover to uh, the graphic novel. Um, I, I drew it uh, 17 by 11, which is uh, not the size I normally draw in. Uh, normally, uh, I draw 8.5 by 13, which is, I think, the size of the prints in the gallery show right now. And um, yeah, so those are printed one-to-one -one scale to how I draw. But the book was printed uh, 6.5 by 10, so it's like standard comic size. So all the pages get shrunken down. I think it looks a lot nicer. Um, yeah, so the cover, I did it 17 by 11 just because I wanted to add as much detail as possible. I wanted it to kind of look like a, a movie poster. Uh, this is the first drawing I ever did of the Dakota Warriors. It's a tote bag illustration for U Comic Con. 
Uh, U-Comic-Con is the Yukon comic book convention that happens in Whitehorse. Um, it happens around, around uh, July or August. And uh, this was the second U-Comic-Con to ever happen uh, in 2015. And they asked me to make something that was equally Yukon as it was nerdy. And uh, this is what I came up with. Um, the composition is originally uh, like a Star Trek cover from the 60s, and it was like Spock and Kirk, like back to back, um, fighting like Klingons or something. And uh, I just really liked the composition, so I was like, I can make my drawing like that too. Uh, yeah, so uh, by the end of the weekend, I'd gotten so many compliments um, on how narrative the story or like the um, tote bag was. So I thought it would be a good idea to continue it as a long form comic. Um, this is a, a panel from the back of the book. So uh, the graphic novel collection has an eight page autobio comic where I, I kind of explain everything. It's kind of more like an artist talk. Um, but yeah, so uh, I took this uh, photo at U Comic Con and then I drew it for the book. Um, that right there, that's my Nana. That's my sister, Dylan, um, who got to come to the Toronto uh, book launch, which was pretty sweet. And she was in Winnipeg last night. I ran to the Via Rail just to say hi to her for like 20 minutes. Um, that's my niece, Trina, and that's my other sister, Destiny. Uh, so a Dakwakata is a high cash, and this is what a high cash is, for those who don't know. Um, it's kind of like an olden day fridge or like a, a safety box. You kinda, you'd put like your food or your valuables that you didn't wanna get wet or eaten from animals. You wanted to keep things protected. You'd put them in a uh, dakukata. Um, and dakukata is also the name of, uh, the traditional name of my hometown, Haines Junction. And uh, I named the book Dakukata Warriors after uh, my hometown. Uh, this is a, a beaded logo of Champagne-Ajac First Nations. It's the uh, First Nations band from my hometown. And uh, Dorothy Wabiska uh, be, uh, beaded this, and it's on display at the Daku Cultural Center in Haines Junction. Um, we have two clans in the Yukon. We have Wolf and Crow, or Southern Toshone people, we have Wolf and Crow. And uh, they're... Uh, represented in my comic with the two characters. Uh, and there's also uh, the traditional colors of the uh, black, white, and red. Those are the, tr the traditional colors of the Southern Toshone people. So that's why I stylistically kept the book black, white, and red uh, as an homage to uh, my culture. Uh, this is like the sci-fi version of the Champagne Jack logo that I drew for the back of the book. Uh, this is a language map for the Yukon, and uh, I grew up uh, seeing this map uh, as a kid in my native language class, and I was taught native language uh, in my hometown from kindergarten to grade 12, and uh, I had the same teacher the whole time, and she ended up becoming my collaborator for this book. But um, yeah, so I grew up uh, going to class and seeing this poster all the time, and I have uh, like deep nostalgia for it now, um, just because it reminds me of home. And uh, I also think it's really important to show a language map instead of a colonial map. Um, I think that's more important to share with you guys. So uh, like I said earlier, uh, Vivian Smith, uh, she was my native language teacher from kindergarten to grade 12. And uh, she's a highly respected elder in my uh, community. And um, she uh, would uh, I'd email her, and then um, she would respond back in the next day or two with a list of words. Um, and originally, what I would do, like for the first issue, is I would make a list of words, and then I would email it to her, and I would ask her to translate it for me. But the, uh, the difficulty in that is that uh, our language doesn't really um, get presented that way. We kind of have to know the context of the sentence and what else is happening in the, like the paragraph or whatever. Um, so I quickly learned it was easier to 
write down my whole um, script, and then I would email them my entire script, and then they would translate what they could, and uh, they said it would help them a lot more with um, the context of how the sentences uh, were said and who they were for. Um, yeah, the funny thing was, uh, like, I drew this for the back of the book, and uh, when I uh, showed it to Vivian uh, last Christmas, she was actually wearing the same jacket and, like, completely the same outfit, and uh, she was, like, super embarrassed about it, but she, she thought it was really funny. Uh, so the next collaborator, like, I had uh, two language preservers work with me, uh, and the other one is Kasha. And uh, Kasha is uh, a member of the Dakota Dancers. He's also, um, he's the language teacher in the Southern Toshone um, Language Immersion Program, which is a two-year program in my hometown. And uh, essentially, as you go out on the land and you practice culture and you learn Southern Toshone and then you, um, you speak it the entire time. And uh, last summer, I went to um, Desdiash Lake and uh, I went to a culture camp with them and they were exclusively speaking in Southern Toshone. There's no English allowed to be spoken. Um, and that was really fun, just trying to remember all the words I uh, wrote in my book and also remembered as a child. Uh, yeah, uh, Kasha is like a true culture warrior, like he lives and breathes Southern Toshone, um, all around great guy. He, uh, he was really easy to work with because I would send him an email at like one or two in the morning and then at like three in the morning he would reply. Um, so we were kind of like on the same schedule and uh, I, I loved working with Vivian but also like she has her own life and she would rep reply when it was most convenient for her. But Kasha was like on it all times. Um, this is a, like a neighborhood map of my hometown. And you can see in the orange there is Dakokata, that's uh, Haines Junction. Um, and then uh, there's a bunch of small communities or like campsites around Dakokata. And uh, that's because uh, Southern Toshone people are actually nomadic and we wouldn't just stay in one spot year round. Um, so if we, uh, if it was the summer, you would probably be in Kluxu and you'd be harvesting salmon. Or if it was the fall, you could be up in Ajak and you were hunting uh, bison or moose or uh, caribou. And then um, you'd spend the winters in like Takini River or something like that. Uh, this is taken from the cultural center in Haines Junction. Uh, so I have a language key in my book, and uh, originally in the self-published issues, it was uh, either at the front or the very back of the book. And uh, what you'd have to do is you'd, when you'd get to a Southern Toshone word in my book, you'd have to flip back and forth between the key and what page you were on, and then you could translate uh, the Southern Toshone into English. Um, that was kind of like the biggest critique from my book was um, the disconnect having to flip back and forth. So I actually uh, spent all last winter editing my book and uh, I edited it so all the translations are on the same page as the words on the, the page and uh, it helps a lot more. I think you can read the book a lot quicker. I think, it, uh, yeah, I think it looks a lot better too. And um, the other thing was uh, I originally had two, di two different Southern Toshone dialects in my book, and that was kind of out of convenience because uh, Vivian spoke the Ajak dialect, and Kasha could speak the Champagne and Ajak dialect. Um, so I would have uh, both dialects in my book just out of the convenience to have as much words as possible because I was always kind of on a deadline to finish my book. Um, so. Uh, the graphic novel, I've edited it, so the book is entirely uh, one dialect, which is the Ajak dialect. And because I did that, I had to spend all last winter uh, editing 100 out of the 110 words in the book. And uh, I would have to, um, I'd have to erase uh, anything, anything misspelled, and then I would have to rewrite it and then because I draw, th like I draw uh, my text on my pages, uh, the backgrounds would all get uh, 
chopped up because of it. So I would have to redraw the backgrounds to make it all flush. And I had to do that to almost every single page. And it was kind of brutal. Um, I can't imagine doing that as like a regular job. Like a, someone who translates like an English book into like Russian and then they have to put like the onomatopoeias into Russian and stuff. Like that is, it was so much work. Like I literally spent all winter changing the dialect. Um, so yeah, you can see here that uh, there's different uh, areas in the Yukon that speak those dialects, and they're um, <clears throat> they're pretty similar, but they're still different. So like, as an example, um, salmon, the Champagne dialect is Samé, but the Ajac dialect is Sambé. So they're very close, but they're different, and you wouldn't normally speak in two different dialects to another uh, another person. So uh, talking to Kasha, we both thought it was smart to change it. So it would just be one dialect. And then on top of that, we edited the book so it would be um, the spelling of uh, the Yukon Native Language Center spelling. So that's the current uh, like simplified version of Southern Toshone that's being taught in schools. Um, so I changed the book to be that. So. Uh, for future generations, it all kind of like lines up and is the same. Uh, this is the cover to the first issue. It came out in uh, November 2016 for the Vancouver Art Book Fair. Um, I resographed uh, all three original issues and I hand bound them myself, uh, trimmed them, stapled them, folded them. Uh, so it's kind of a, a big relief to have a book out from a publisher because I, I don't have to do that anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, I named uh, the Dakota Warriors not only after uh, my hometown, but I named them after the Dakota Dancers, uh, the traditional song and dance group that I mentioned earlier. And uh, my sisters are current members. They're um, right here. The two right there, and then um, my dad, who's right here, and then my mom is right there. Um, she's also a member, and then uh, over here in the corner, uh, Kasha is also a member, and then even our chief, uh, Steve Smith, is a member, and he's right here. Um, so it's like a big uh, community affair, our Dakota dancers. Um, sometimes you can go to a show of theirs, and there'll be like 40 people, performing and it's like a huge performance and other times you can go and there'll be like 12 people um, so it really uh, varies in um, attendance performance but uh, yeah they're they're great uh, this is the photo I based that drawing off of it was taken at um, in Juneau Alaska for the cel uh, the celebration and uh, for those who don't know what that is it's a big powwow that happens um, every other year. So there was one last year in 2018, so there won't be another one until 2020. And uh, is, uh, the celebration in Juneau is amazing because uh, indigenous people from all over the world go. And uh, when I've gone as a kid, I've seen uh, Maori dancers and like Tibetan throat singers and stuff. It's like an amazing, uh, uh, powwow. And if uh, you're ever in Alaska in June and it happens to be the time for a celebration, you should definitely go. Uh, so not only did I want to include uh, traditional language and culture, but I also wanted to include traditional tools. So one of the things I included uh, was an atlatl. And uh, for those who don't know what an atlatl is, it's a throwing spear. And essentially, uh, you have this handle and uh, your arrow kind of sits into that little hook at the top. And um, it's all kind of like from a, your flick of the wrist. So you can see it here. Um, he's got his hand. It's kind of like badminton in a sense where it's like the same position. And then um, it's all just the flick. And the amazing thing is that they're really powerful tools. And uh, if you've ever used one, you can tell why that they were hunting uh, like bison and moose with them because uh, they're really powerful. And uh, if you're ever in uh, Whitehorse uh, in the Yukon, there's a Beringia Center, which is the Ice Age Museum. And uh, they have an atlatl throwing range there. 
And when I was a kid, uh, you'd go to the Bringia Center on a field trip and you'd get to build your own atlatl out of wood. Um, and then you get to throw it in the atlatl throwing range. The cool thing about that range is that uh, there's a bunch of giant like wood cutouts of animals, but they're all from the Beringia era. So they're like giant beavers and like woolly mammoths and like giant sloths. Um, and the, the cute thing is that like um, they're originally made in uh, like the 70s, like when the, uh, when the museum was built. And uh, they've been outside for like four decades. So they're like really um, weathered down now and stuff. And they're all hand painted. So it's like, uh, yeah, they're really beautiful to look at now, even though they're kind of wilted. But uh, yeah, they're super fun, full of dents from all the atlatl throwing. Uh, this is the first page to the uh, first issue. And uh, you can see here at the top, like uh, the, the graphic novel now has um, numbers. Uh, the, I have the Southern Toshone numbered uh, chronological order to how they appear. Um, so this page has eight uh, Southern Toshone words. And uh, yeah, so they're all uh, in order. And uh, I think it helps a lot more to have it this way than the original way, um, just as a faster read. And uh, I still have the language key at the back of the book, but it, I guess it's just like, uh, it's not as uh, relevant as it was before. Uh, so not only, um, like I didn't want to um, just draw an earth, like a literal earth or a literal moon or sun um, I thought it was important to um, represent those things as form line. And uh, I don't know if it's like a, a prairie thing, but it's definitely a, a West Coast thing to, uh, with form line, to put faces and hands on everything. And um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's a carver, and he was saying how it's, um, it's us putting like a bit of humanity into those things and objects. And uh, I think that's right. Like, uh, and I thought it was more important to uh, kind of give the earth kind of its own character than to draw a literal earth. And you can see it in the book. Um, there'll be different scenes where like explosions are happening or some actions happening in the background, and then like the sun or the moon are like looking at it and they're making expressions. They're like reacting to the situation. Uh, this is the cover to the second issue, which came out in May of 2017. Um, this was when I went to TCAF and I started uh, sharing my book to other publishers. And I told them uh, that I was going to do a third issue and then the book was done. Um, and uh, yeah, that's when uh, Conundrum first showed their interest in it. Uh, I mainly wanted to focus on the backstories for the characters in the second issue because the first one's kind of just strictly action. Um, so I, I really focused on the backstory for the, the cyber Sasquatch. And uh, you, you find out that he was abducted as a child um, from the, the uh, space pioneer. And, uh, this is kind of like uh, an obvious allegory towards uh, residential schools and like the 60s scoop. Um, a lot of legends uh, on the Northwest Coast for Sasquatch kind of go either way. Um, one, like, one way is that he's like a crazy bushman and he'll like steal your child and he'll steal your wife so he can have a family. Um, but there's other, the other side of it is that there's legends where he's the earth uh, protector and he saves the forest and he's very violent because uh, he wants to protect um, his environment. And uh, yeah, I thought it was important to show that, um, that he was abducted as a child to, to kind of lean towards the more... Um, uh, that he was human at one point, and that um, he wasn't always a villain. Uh, the other thing uh, is that you can, you can see on this page, uh, the Space uh, Pioneers uh, headquarters is actually a dredge. 
and it's based off the dredge number four in Dawson City, Yukon. And uh, for those who don't know what a dredge is, it's a huge excavation machine, like gigantic, like, a, like it's the size of like two houses. And um, they scrape the bottom of uh, creeks and riverbeds uh, looking for valuable minerals like gold, like, uh, like they were built for the gold rush. And um, essentially, uh, this side uh, scrapes into the creeks and riverbeds, and then uh, all the dirt and rocks come up, and then they get sifted through in the building. And then uh, once the gold has been panned and uh, sifted through, all the big boulders come out on the other side. And um, yeah, so these were built all along the Yukon River during the Klondike. And uh, dredge number four is uh, owned by Parks Canada in Dawson. And uh, you can get a tour of it. And when I went to SOVA, the Yukon School of Visual Arts, I did a foundation program there. Um, that was part of the or orientation, is that we got to go to dredge number four and get a tour of it. Uh, this is a residential school uh, that I drew uh, based off one in uh, BC. And um, a lot of uh, looking into research for this book, a lot of Yukon history and BC First Nations history, um, I discovered uh, that the last residential school actually closed down in 1996. Um, and uh, there's actually, uh, so I was three years old when uh, the last residential school shut down. And uh, it's kind of surreal to think that because um, I'm part of the first generation of champagne uh kids that got to grow up with champagne Jack as a band my entire life. Um, and uh, I thought it was always like uh, second nature to like have champagne Jack and have all these resources. Um, but I later found out that uh, champagne Jack First Nations um, started in September 1993. So I was one month old then uh, when champagne Jack became a self-governing nation. Uh, yeah, so this is the cover to the third issue. And uh, the third issue came out a year later in uh, May of 2018. And uh, I wanted to introduce new uh, warriors, and you can see them on the cover. Uh, this is the language map that I drew for uh, my book. Uh, like I said earlier, I thought it was more important to show a language map of the Yukon when I drew a map of the Yukon, um, just because I thought it, it just, to have a colonial map uh, just didn't make any sense to me, and I thought it was more uh, important to show uh, the different cultures in the Yukon. And uh, you can see uh, the Dakota warriors flying back to their hometown uh, in uh, Haines Junction, and then you can see the uh, Luan Mon warriors leaving uh, Burwash Landing, and uh, the Dakwaquan warriors leaving uh, uh, Teslin. So uh, these are our new warriors, and uh, the Luan Mon warriors are, um, I say, they're our family from Burwash Landing. And Burwash Landing is about an hour drive away from my hometown, Haines Junction. And uh, they also have Wolf and Crow clans, but they also have different clans um, as well. Like uh, they have the Frog clan, and they also have the, the Sheep clan. And I wanted to represent those, so I, I created warriors for them. And then uh, the Dakwaquan warriors, uh, which is Clinket for inland Clinket, uh, they're from Teslin. And um, uh, Clinket people have their own clans as well. So uh, I introduced the killer whale and the eagle uh, warriors. And uh, yeah, so these four warriors represent uh, different clans that are also in the Yukon. Uh, one of the other reasons why I wanted to introduce um, new warriors was because uh, when I was looking into research for my book, um, I learned about the, the document uh, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow. And uh, it was written in 1973 by um, all the uh, 
current chiefs at the time for Yukon First Nations. And uh, we had three Champaign Ajac First Nations um, help write it, Elijah Smith, Harry Allen, and Dave Joe. And uh, essentially, is uh, all Yukon First Nations co-wrote this document together, and then they presented it to Parliament uh, in 1973. And um, it's the reason why we have self-governing nations in the Yukon. And uh, when I learned about this, uh, I also learned uh, that it actually didn't get into fully into effect until 1993. So even though this was presented in 73, it still took another 20 years before champagne Ajac was its own nation. Uh, this is uh, my uh, neighborhood map. And you can see uh, Luan Mon, Kwani Lake. Uh, up at the top, and then uh, Dakwakata, Hins Junction's kind of in the middle, um, and then there's Whitehorse, the capital. And I have Whitehorse there because um, the uh, Dakwakwan warriors are named after the Dakwakwan dancers, which is a Whitehorse uh, traditional song and dance group. And um, Teslin, uh, the Dakwakwan warriors, where I say they're from, would uh, just be like another hour or hour and a half outside of White Horse, um, the opposite way of Haines Junction. And uh, the people at the bottom here, this is the Dakokwan dancers. And uh, my sister, my niece, and my brother-in-law are all members. Um, so this is my sister, this is my niece, and then this is my brother-in-law, Blake. And um, my brother-in-law, Blake, actually did a pinup for the back of my book. And uh, he drew a drum, and it's really beautiful. Uh, and I have three other pinups in the back of my book. Uh, one of them is the medallion I'm wearing right now. And um, a friend of mine, uh, Teresa Vandermeer uh, from uh, uh, Beaver Creek, uh, she uh, beaded it for me. And uh, I asked her um, to make a beaded piece for my book uh, as a pinup. And uh, like a week later, uh, she made this. And then she was like, what's your address? And then she mailed it to me. And I didn't think she was going to mail it to me. Um, but I'm like totally blown away. So I've been wearing it like every day. Anytime I do a presentation on my book, I'm wearing this. And I love it. Um, it's, it's crazy, because I feel like uh, I, something like an artwork like this would cost like $500 to commission like easily. So I feel very spoiled getting to wear it. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's my niece, there's my sister, Erin, and then there's Blake. And this was taken in Teslin. So uh, I also wanted to introduce um, new tools because I introduced new clans and warriors. So I gave um, the Luan Mon warriors uh, fishing gaffs. And um, that's because uh, Luan Mon means um, fish like. And uh, so yeah, so I thought it was important to give them fishing gaffs. And then the uh, Dakwakwan warriors, because they're clinket, I thought it was appropriate to give them uh, copper daggers. Um, okay, and uh, in my opinion, uh, I would say that this is the most important page in the entire book. And uh, I'm saying that out of personal reasons. Um, the first is, uh, uh, the elder that you see on the on the page, um, her name was Annie Ned, and she was a real elder from my home community, and she um, really paved the way uh, for language revitalization and cultural revival. Um, she really put her foot down and said that like we need to record our stories with elders, we need to um, practice our songs, we need to dance our traditions. Um, yeah, she was a big reason why uh, Yukon First Nations culture is still alive. And um, to get her in my book, I had to go through some hoops. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink of water. Um, yeah, so I had to go through some hoops to include her in my book. Uh, the first one was that I had to ask permission. And to ask permission, I had to ask um, her two oldest living uh, family members. And um, 
the first one I asked was my Auntie Diane. And she's not really my auntie, but she's known me since I was born. And she's the leader of the Dakota Dancers. Um, she's the, the granddaughter of um, Annie Ned. And so I came to her and I asked her for her permission. And she said, OK, well, why do you want to include her in your book? Um, and the reason I said uh, I wanted her to say um, that she was the founder of the Dakota Warriors and that her purpose was to demonstrate and live Danke, which means our way in Southern Toshone, it's our way of life. Um, so uh, Diane gave me permission and uh, she said I had to ask the other side of the family though. So uh, I asked her, okay, who do I ask? And she replied, uh, uh, Mary Jane Jim who's actually my sister's uh, grandmother. And uh, so that was uh, a relief. And uh, I went to her, and I asked her for permission. And I told her why I wanted to include her grandma. And she said, yeah, of course. Yeah, go for it. Um, so once I had both, the si both family, um, uh, I, once I had their approval, uh, I went to champagne Ajac. And I asked for uh, access to their archive photos. And the first thing they asked me was like, well, do you have permission from the family to look at these photos? And I said, yes. I asked Mary Jane and Diane. They said yes. Um, and they were like, OK, great. Uh, they gave me um, 10 photos. And uh, they told me I wasn't allowed to um, share online any of the photos except one of them, um, which is the one I actually chose. And the reason why it's, um, I'm allowed to show you is because it, there's a huge poster of it in the, Haines Jun like the Daku Cultural Center in Haines Junction. Um, so yeah, I had to go ask uh, both sides of the family. And then I also had to get access from Champagne et Jack. Um, and even then, they said like I couldn't share any of the other photos. Um, yeah, and then there's some other um, icons on this page that are very important. Like I have uh, the Dakwakata to represent my hometown, Haines Junction. I have um, a rifle and a fishing gaff to represent traditional hunting. I have um, a salmon to represent traditional food. And then um, the, the drum in the corner is, uh, was actually my, my brother's drum. Uh, who passed away between issues two and three. And uh, I really focused uh, on working, like trying to finish the third issue during my brother's um, untimely death. And uh, uh, I kind of just like put all my uh, like focus and uh, frustration into my comic. And uh, I thought about like throwing the, in the towel and like taking the year off and like I had all these book fairs and things uh, ready and like I even had um, interest in the collection already and I was just like I didn't think that my brother would want me to just like take a year off and not want to finish my book so um, I worked really hard to finish the third issue um, fighting through the grief and uh, yeah I'm really happy um, that I did that uh, so this is the photo of Annie Ned, and uh, when I asked uh, my auntie Diane uh, where this was taken, um, she said it was probably taken in Carcross, and it would have been the late 60s or early 70s. Um, so to put this uh, photo in context, um, like residential schools would have been in full swing still, um, the 60s scoop would have been happening. Um, the potlatch ban would have just been lifted. So you can see a bunch of elders practicing their culture and not going to jail for it for once. And um, yeah, you can just see the expression on their, their, uh, the people's faces about how happy they are just to practice their culture and uh, live their lives and um, you know, not be criminals for just practicing who they are. And uh, yeah, so they have this poster, like a huge poster of it at uh, the Daku Cultural Center. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just so powerful. And uh, looking at all the other archive photos, it just made the most sense to use this one. And 
yeah, that's, uh, that's my uh, presentation. Dr. Lorena Fontaine, uh, UW Indigenous Academic Lead, would like to close today's event by speaking about Indigenous language uh, revitalization here at the University of Winnipeg. So I, I'd just like to thank Cole for the presentation. Um, I, I found that when I was listening to you, not only did I hear some of the words from your community, but I now know about your family, some of your traditional dance, and um, I, I know more about your culture, and I think that um, all Indigenous languages, when we're teaching, um, that's, that's what we're teaching. We're not just teaching the words, but our identity as well. So I think your work is really important, and I think it's really important for us um, in, as Indigenous peoples when we're teaching the language that we share that identity with each other because it enriches us all, I think. So um, thank you for that. We are at the University of Winnipeg trying to um, develop some language programming on campus because, um, because we need to. Um, we are currently working on a thematic major in Indigenous languages, um, so we're hoping to offer that program in the fall. Um, it'll slowly evolve into a program that we hope that Michif speakers, Dakota, um, Dene, Oji Cree, and Cree and Ojibwe people um, can learn their languages as well as um, do language revitalization work. Um, the other thing that we're working on right now, well, it's, we have an event on Thursday that you're all welcome to attend. It's in the library at 12. We'll have lunch, so you don't have to bring your lunch that day if you, um, uh, if you do often bring your lunch. Um, we will be um, closing off a year-long initiative where we try to have language events celebrating Indigenous languages on campus. So on Thursday, the closing event will be, um, uh, we'll have a Dakota speaker come to do a reading um, in Dakota. We will have a, a student that was involved in the, um, the ISP program. Um, graduate students apply for this program every year. Um, and do various work on campus with professors. And this year, um, there was a student, um, Elmer Clark, I think his name is, um, who did some work um, identifying um, the way to classify indigenous languages um, in the library. And it, he did such an amazing job, and it's quite innovative work that we're going to be sharing that um, during the noon hour. And, um, and then we'll have a feast. So you're all welcome to come. It starts at noon. Um, it should end at around 2. But if you want to just come and listen to the speakers and have a quick bite to eat and go to class or wherever you need to be, that's fine as well. You're all welcome. Um, so I think that's it for me. Miigwech. And uh, thank you again, Cole. So before everyone goes, um, I'd like to invite you to the final one book event um, on Friday from 12.30 to 1.30, award-winning Swampy Cree graphic novelist David Alexander Robertson will be speaking in Eckhart Gramate on truth, representation, and reconciliation in comics. So everyone is welcome to that. And I definitely um, encourage you to go buy Cole's book. Um, he will be outside of Gallery 1CO3 right away. Thank you.